Mwaza Mira muma waka Kenja Chita Mare Rarunya Rarokuta Mira muma waka Zira kuta mira muma wako ake Zira ya penya suwa ne suwa kuta Mira muma wako ake Kuta mira muma wako ake ake suwa Zira kuta mira muma wako ake Geru nyara oronje nzi wapeto kuta Mira muma wako ake Wafamiwe se kutunga miram Shambu kurizo zisinga zozimi Kujeka kwa mkuno tipenye ram Dipe baiberi masoko machene Dino tewe ram Kujeka kwa rozi kumeto Zitito mutemo neru doze Seza kumbana mom Dipe baiberi Aponda tambu zwa ngezi tema Nehu rombo wa zom Dipe basio jesu ata uoram Kundi tonde ta aripo petom Dipe baiberi masoko machene Dino teweram kujeka farozi Kumezo zitito mutemo Neru doze seza kumbana mom Dipe baiberi Dino fambanaro Rindi teure Rendeza kaipa Mwenji weru Pone so mune dima Kundi pangi Tanti ya kurenga Dipe baiberi Masoko machene Dino tewera Kuje kaparo Zikometo 
Tito Mutemo Nerudo Jem Seja Kumba Namon Dipe Baiberi Mwenje Weu Penyu Usinga Kumi Ne Wakana Kam Rindi Atite Rujeko Wachesu Rindi One Sembi Kulenga Today we are continuing our series on the book of Hebrews and we are interested in uh, looking at the third chapter of Hebrews today. We have given as a title for our study today, Seeing God's Works but Not Knowing God's Ways. Seeing God's Works but Not Knowing God's Ways. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you may be with us today, that you may open to, to us the treasures of your word. Speak to us so that we are challenged and that we are made ready to interact with you and to grow in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 3 is a very interesting chapter. We could say that chapter 3 is trying to help us to learn from experience. Learning from experience is a wonderful kind of learning. We need to learn from the experiences of others. As we observe what has happened to other people, it is important for us to learn. If we do not observe what's happening to other people, we are constantly going to be repeating their mistakes. We must also learn from our own experience. As God exposes us to new experiences, he intends that we learn and we grow, getting to know him better, getting to know how to respond better to future situations. So we could say the call of Hebrews chapter 3 is to learn. It says learn, learn, learn. That's what it is saying to us. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses was also faithful in all his house. I want you to notice that this passage begins by calling the addressees holy brethren. These are Jewish people who had accepted Jesus as their Lord and Master. And so the apostle refers to them as holy brethren. They have become holy because they are associated with a God who is holy. And they have accepted a holy calling. So they have become holy. He describes them as partakers of the heavenly calling. That means they have responded to a call that came from heaven. They have not responded to a call that came from some preacher. They responded to God's call from heaven. And so it is with each one of us. When we become Christians, we are not responding to the invitation of the pastor, responding to the invitation of some human being. We are responding to a voice from heaven. It is a call from heaven that we are responding to. The apostle therefore addresses them as holy brethren. They are considered holy because they are related to a God who is holy. The concept of holy 
has to do with setting something apart for a special purpose. And so these brethren, these Jewish believers, had accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord, and they are therefore described as holy brethren. They are partakers of a heavenly calling. So because they had accepted Jesus, they had now come into the family of God in a special way. They had responded to that heavenly call. So we must remember that when we talk about being holy, we are talking about being set apart. When you take something out of the many, something out of a group, something from the common, and you put it aside for a special use, we can describe that in the sense of being holy. God sets us apart in a relationship to himself. We are no longer just ordinary people. We are God's own people chosen by him. Holiness is an attribute that we derive from being in a special relationship with God. So I am holy, not because of something intrinsic within me, but because I have accepted a special relationship with God. So these holy brethren form a new kind of relationship. They are not brethren in the flesh. They are not your traditional brothers and sisters who are also Jews. These are people who have stepped out of their natural relationships and they've accepted the new relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, they are holy. You remember how Peter says, be ye holy, for I am holy. God wants us to be holy because he himself is holy. Come to think of it, true Christians are scattered all over the world. They come from all kinds of backgrounds. They come from different races, different tribes, different languages, ethnicities. They come from different walks of life. They have become Christians. They are holy brethren. They are now one. They belong to one family, the family of God. Even though they may be different in their looks, they are now one family, a different background, but one new identity. So their natural languages, their social networks, their economic rank doesn't define them anymore. They are now defined as God's holy people. They have responded to a call from heaven. So they are all bound up. These people from different parts of the world, some from Africa, some from Asia, some from Europe, some from the Americas, but they've all responded to Jesus Christ. They become all one in Christ Jesus. They have this unbreakable bond in Christ. That's what happens to you. That's what happens to me when we say yes to Jesus Christ. We are holy brethren. We have been called with a heavenly calling. And so we have become a special people. Now, the passage begins by using the expression wherefore or therefore. That suggests that there's a connection between what we are finding here in chapter 3 and what has gone on in chapters 1 and 2 of Hebrews. In view of the status of Jesus being, in chapter 1, the express image of God, being the creator and upholder of all things, in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, being the great communicator of God in chapter 1, verse 1, being the upholder of all things, being a sufficient redeemer, being greater than angels, being made a little lower than angels for a short while for the suffering of death, so that he might be able to lead humanity back to God. So the apostle says, think of all of these things, when you think about Jesus Christ. So he says, consider Jesus Christ. The word that is translated consider is the Greek word katanoeo. The word katanoeo suggests a focused look. A look that begins in the mind that also utilizes the eyes. So it is a focused look, a look that involves the mind considering something carefully. It is a deep look that leads to a closer understanding of what is being looked at. 
So the apostle says, take a deep look at Jesus. Look at him as the express image of God. Look at him as the upholder of all things. Look at him as the one who made all things in the universe. Look at him as one who is greater than the angels. Look at him as one who sits by the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. Look at him made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death. But look at him who is greater than the angels in his status. Look at Jesus. Consider Jesus. So the writer is saying, when you decide on what you are going to do, first consider Jesus. Think of Jesus before you take action. Think of the various aspects of Jesus. Jesus, the great high priest of our calling, as mentioned in chapter 2. Think of him before you decide to do anything. Consider Jesus. So Jesus has been presented as being a merciful and faithful high priest in chapter 2. He is able to sympathize with us. He is able to render a helping hand to struggling sinners. He is described as the apostle, the great apostle. He was sent by the Father. He was sent to effect salvation. He is the captain of our salvation. He is sent to lead many sons to glory. So he tells us in verses 3 and 4, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, for this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he, has, he who has built the house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. So the apostle is making a comparison between Jesus and Moses. And he says that Jesus is greater than Moses. Now Moses was the greatest leader that Israel ever had. He led Israel from the land of Egypt all through the years of the wilderness wandering and brought them to the border of the promised land. What a great leader, leading them those 40 years. So he was a great leader, highly regarded. They especially regarded him well after he was dead. While he was still alive, they sometimes did not show so much respect. But once Moses died, they had a very high respect of him. But Jesus is greater than Moses. Greater than Moses in his mission, greater than Moses in his glory. For Moses was only a servant in the house, in God's house. But Jesus is a son who has authority over that which he has created. So Jesus is greater. Now we want to look at the failure of ancient Israel. What is it that happened to ancient Israel? That makes them to have seen God's works, but not have known God's ways. I want us to go back to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 17, and we are going to read verses 1 to 7, but first we look at verses 1 to 3. It says here, Then all the congregation of Israel set out on their journey, from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord. And they came at Raphidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contented with Moses, give us water. We want water to drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses, and they said, Why is it that you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Why have you done that? Verses 4 to 7. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your rod, which you use for striking the, the river, and go, and behold, I will stand before you by the rock on Herob. And you shall strike the rock 
and water shall come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the contention of the people of Israel, because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So we notice what's happening here. Because they lacked water, they are quarreling with Moses. They are accusing Moses of having brought, him to the brought them to the wilderness so that they might perish. Interesting that these same people had witnessed many, many miracles. Do you remember the ten plagues in the land of Egypt? You remember their experience by the Red Sea? How the Lord opened up the sea before them? You remember how the Lord guided them? How he destroyed their enemies, the Egyptians who were following them? How he set them on the other side, having walked through dry land? But they had forgotten. They had forgotten all that God had done for them. Now we go to the book of Psalms, Psalm 95. Verses 7 to 11, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion and as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and they tried me, though they saw my works for 40 years, I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts. They do not know my ways. So I saw in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. I want you to notice what's happening here. God says of the people, they have seen my works, but they don't seem to know my ways. I have led them and performed the miracles before them, but somehow they look like they have not learned to trust me. So they've seen my works, but they have not known my ways. So God says I was angry with that generation and I swore in my anger, they will not enter into my rest. Why did God lead his people through the wilderness? Why was God angry with that generation? Let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 to 4. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commands or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger. He fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor your fathers, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I want you to notice why God led them through the wilderness, why he allowed them to have times of wonder, times of scarcity, times of lack. It says he led you so that he might humble you, so that he might teach you to know that man does not live by bread alone, but by the words that come out of the mouth of God. So Israel in the wilderness experienced God's power and God's deliverance time after time. They were permitted to experience trials and testings, to run short of water and food, to not know about tomorrow, God wanted them to learn to trust him so that they could look to him as their provider. It says in Deuteronomy 8 verses 4 and 5, Your garments did not wear out in those 40 years, and your feet did not become swollen. You should know in your heart that a man, as a man chastens his son, so the Lord also chastens you. So God's lessons of faith are not learned in a comfort zone. God does not allow us to be in comfort while he is teaching us how to trust him. He allows trials to come upon his children. Only when we are being tried, when we are being challenged, do we learn how to trust him. So Israel needed to know where their bread came from, that it comes from God. They needed to know where their water came from, that it's from God. They needed to trust him for their safety, for their protection. God was training them, and God is training us to become men and women of faith. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, God talks about how he led the Israelites in the wilderness. He says, for the Lord's portion is his people, chapter 32, verses 9 and 10, 
For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young. He spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. The Lord alone guided them. I want you to notice God is described as an eagle, that is a young one. And how he takes care of Israel is how an eagle takes care of its young one. And how it encircles it and how it stirs up the nest, disturbing the nest so that the young eagle doesn't become too comfortable, must learn how to fly, how to be able to be independent. I want you to note that God had allowed his children to witness the plagues in Egypt. He had led them to walk through the dry land over the Red Sea. He had allowed them to eat the manna, the bread of miracles, to drink water from a rock. He had made water sweet. They had a first-hand experience of God. They knew him. They saw him at work. So they had a basis for being able to know what kind of God he is. So to know, to see God's works is to witness his promises. But to not know God's ways is to fail to make the connection between God's power in the past and our present situation. To react in the present or in the future, to react as if we don't know that God can save. To react with a sense of fear and panic when God has saved us in the past, that is to fail to know God's ways. That's what makes God to be angry with his people. So he tells us in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 14, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you who have an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast our confidence to the very end. So the apostle is saying, be careful, beware, lest you find yourselves in the same situation of Israel, failing to understand God's ways when you have witnessed his works in your life. In verses 16 to 19, Hebrews chapter 3, uh, For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not those who were led out by Moses from Egypt? Now with whom was God angry those forty years? Was it not with those who sinned in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? Was it not to those who had been called but who fell into unbelief? So the very same people that God had a high destiny for had failed because they did not follow through in knowing God's ways. In God's school, he supplies what we need in one area of life, but he allows a shortage in another area of life. That's what happens. So the Israelites found that they had enough food, but not enough water. At other times, they had enough water, but not enough food. So God was training them to trust him for that which he is lacking. By providing sufficient in one area, God was saying to them, look, I'm able to provide for you. Sometimes we have health, but we don't have money to pay the rent. Sometimes the money is there, but we don't have the rent. But we have to look at how God has led us in the past. When we have seen God's works, we then need to know how God works in our present. So we need to be observant of God's ways so that we may be able to see how to respond to him when new challenges come up. The apostle challenges us to consider Jesus, to focus on him. There is a sinful forgetfulness. The Israelites engaged in this sinful forgetfulness where they forget everything God has done for them because they are faced with a new problem. It is sinful to forget 
Well, God has been so good to us, and we act as if we have not known his goodness. The apostle challenges us to consider Jesus Christ, to focus on him, to remember who he has been in our lives, what great things he has done for us. He warns us of the danger of sinful forgetfulness, forgetting what God has done in the past and panicking in the present. He reminds us of the danger of unbelief. Unbelief is not a stated denial of God. It is not something that says, I don't believe God. I don't believe he exists. Unbelief is simply to respond to life situations as if we do not know there is a God who cares. Unbelief is being, being blind in the present even though we have seen God's hand in the past. That is unbelief. Remember the history of Israel. Learn from their failure. Remember God's works in your very own life, demonstrations of his goodness and his power. Remember to act in faith because he is faithful who has called you. So let us remember. Let's see God's works, but let's also know God's ways. Let's remember in our times of crisis that indeed God can be trusted. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you. We thank you for providing us many lessons in the past. We ask that you may help us as we go on into the future to continue to trust you until we see your hand unfold in our lives. We thank you for being with us and for hearing us today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Atiimbe pamwete se Utazitaro na tenzi Bili ya mambo ya mwari Utazitaro na tenzi Mwese kuzanyi sitara tenzi Utazitaro na tenzi Mwese kuzanyi sitara tenzi Utazitaro na tenzi Jesu zitare masimba Uza zitaro la tenzi Rine simba kuponesa Uza zitaro la tenzi Mwese kuzanyi zitara tenzi Uza zitaro la tenzi Mwese kuzanyi zitara tenzi Kuza zitaro la tenzi Kati pume zinyanga ton Kuza zitaro la tenzi Tache nuru angelo paro Kuza zitaro la tenzi Mwese kuza nyi Zitara tenzi Kuza zitara Na tenzi Mwese kuza nyi Zitara tenzi Kuza zitara Na tenzi Mwese kuza nyi Zitara tenzi Kuza zitara Na tenzi Mwese kuza nyi Zitara tenzi Kuza zitaro la tenzi Mwese kuza nyi Zitara tenzi Kuza zitaro la tenzi Mwese kuza nyi Zitara tenzi Kuza zitaro la tenzi